thank you, Michael. I think um, <clears throat> happy to be here. Yeah, to those of you who came to hear Sean, I I apologize. He'll be back with you shortly, and I know you're looking forward to that. When you have a guest speaker, it's it's almost like you're on a blind date. You know, you don't know each other, and you remember blind. Some of you met perhaps in blind dates. The way I looked in high school, it's the only kind I could ever get. I'll never forget one time my good friend Chuck, who was very, you know, good with ladies, he said to me, John, what are you doing this Friday night? Well, most of my Friday nights were free. And I said, why? He said, well, he said, I want to take my girl out to the movies, but my mother said, because my cousin Doris is coming to visit, I can't go unless I find a date for Doris. So I was wondering if you, I said, I don't know, Chuck, I don't know her. And he said, come on, you know, she's a nice girl and she's got a great personality. Now, you know what that means when they say that. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, no, I, I, I don't know. He said, come on, you know, it would really help out. I really want, he said, tell you what, let's do this. He said, when it comes Friday night, you come down to the house, you, you uh, knock on the door, I'll send Doris to answer the door. And when she comes, if she's not up to your standards, you know, if she's, you know, okay, we'll go. But if she's not up to your standards, just, you know, sort of grab your throat and go <gasps> like you're having an asthma attack and, and we'll let you out. And I said, I, I don't know. He said, come on, it works. I know I've done it. And uh, so I, I thought about it. I thought, okay, I, you know, I'll go. So came Friday night and knocked on Chuck's door on his family's home, and Doris came to the door, and she opened it, and Chuck had been wrong. She was absolutely gorgeous, and I was just speechless standing there. She looked at me, and she went, <gasps> <laughs> So, if you see Michael or, you know, people who know me, you grab in your throat, kind of give me a high sign, and we'll cut this a little bit shorter if it's necessary. I want you to understand something this morning. Maybe you already do, <clears throat> but around Center Point in your community, there are millions of crippled people in this culture who have no idea that they are restricted or that they can be cured. These are people who are being ignored as what I call the disguised cripples. Now, what am I talking about? Let me give you an example. Tom Brady is a quarterback today who's going to appear in the Super Bowl. Prior to that, he had been for the New England Patriots for a number of years. He's one of the great NFL stories. He was not highly regarded when he came out of college. He was drafted in the sixth round, the 199th player who was taken. And he was a lightly regarded backup quarterback until the starting quarterback got injured and he stepped in and the rest, they say, is history. He's won numerous Super Bowls. This is the 10th one he's appearing in. Accomplishment that ranks him probably the greatest quarterback who, who has ever played the game. He's also matched up, married to a labeled supermodel. They have beautiful children. They live in a lavish environment. He has countless endorsements, all the things of which just radiate success. But with all of Tom Brady's accomplishments and fame, I've never forgotten a 60-minute interview he did several years ago, and you can look it up if you want to, an interview by Steve Croft. And I'm quoting now. He says to Steve Croft, why do I have these Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. You've reached your goal, your dream, your world. Me, I'm thinking it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't. This can't be all what it's cracked up to be. Interviewer Croft then says, well, what's the answer? And Brady replied, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. There's a God-sized hole in every single human heart that only the eternal God can fill. And still, there are a lot of people out there who are going through the motions. They have full schedules, but hungry hearts. They have success without real pleasure. There is a continual hunger they have in a glitzy junk food world. And they are in the cubicle beside you when you work, or in your neighborhood, or in the locker room, or in your acquaintance. These are the people I refer to as disguised cripples. 
people who give you all the appearance of health and happiness, but inside they are living, as Julia Ward Howe once said, living quiet lives of desperation. Do you see them? More importantly than that, do you think that by you being in association with them, they have a better chance of finding the answer to their hungry heart and crippled nature? Or by this church? There was a man who was severely crippled that was brought to Jesus on one occasion, blessed because of some unnamed friends who involved him in an encounter and I've always enjoyed this story found in Mark chapter 2 because not only does this display God's power, primarily because of the mental picture it presents and of the quiet and what I call heroic nature of some unnamed participants. And I don't use the word heroes there very lightly because here were four guys who saw a need for their friend to have an encounter with Jesus so that his life could be changed and his future could be clarified. Listen, this is what it says. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them, since they could not get to him or to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Now stop there for just a second before we go on with this story, and look at this picture and, and kind of get it in your mind. First, there was a great enthusiasm because Jesus was returning to Capernaum, and word had spread about him uh, how great he was. And second, there was standing room only, you know, that it was there. It included friends and critics, but this was a preacher's dream because preachers like crowds. I told Sean, I, I really am sorry he didn't get to enjoy Easter last year because if you remember Easter, everybody stayed home or didn't get to enjoy Christmas Eve or, or probably this Easter is going to be also. But preachers are, you know, always juiced up because crowds can do that. But in the middle of the preacher's dream, the overflow crowd, came the preacher's nightmare. And that was an interruption. Now, when an interruption happens in a service, it's really difficult to recover because everybody turns to look at what the commotion is doing and occurring, and they're not paying attention. On this occasion, the roof was being ripped up above the people, and there would be dirt and debris that would be falling down, and you can imagine the people standing down there would be beginning to grumble. And once that had happened, even before they lowered him down, this would be hard to really recover when Jesus was talking. Several years ago, I was doing a funeral in a large funeral home, and it was a good crowd. The lady was really well liked. And right in the middle of the funeral as I was giving it, suddenly in the third row, right in the middle, a guy's cell phone went off. And he was having trouble fishing it out to turn it off, which I thought he was going to do. But not only was that bad enough and, and distracted everybody, it was playing a tune. It was playing, take me out to the ball game. <laughs> and worse than that, he answered it. Hello? I can't, I can't talk. I, I said I can't talk right now. He gave me, I expected one of these. I thought he was going to give me for just a second. But it was almost impossible to get the attention back once that happened. Another time I was preaching when, years ago, there was a young man in our congregation who was trying to, in, in bodybuilding, he was trying to be Mr. Kentucky and he came in third place. Well, he was seated in about the fifth row from the back and suddenly his mother who was beside him, had a heart condition, passed out, leaned over on him and was totally out. And I was leading into the invitation at that time, you know, trying to draw people to make a decision. Well, he basically stood up, picked her up, and bench pressed her as he walked across the pew and moving her that way. And everybody's looking at nobody was going to be converted after that. It was going on. On another occasion, I was just starting to preach. This was just a couple years before I retired and, and just starting to end the sermon. 
when the children's minister in another part of the building decided to use a fog machine. Why, I don't know. But the fog machines kicked out a lot, a lot of fog and suddenly it set off the fire alarm. Now, if you've ever been in a building where the fire alarm goes off, the first 30 seconds is kind of bad, but then it gets worse, it gets piercing. Well, everybody had to exit and go to the parking lot. And I knew once they got the parking lot, they weren't coming back in and, uh, you know, and they were gone. And I did say that was a former youth minister that uh, we used to have. <laughs> but you know, when an interruption occurs, you know, that it is impossible. Now the roofs were purposely flat in that era and there would be stairs leading up to the roof outside because it was a place where people could relax on the cool of the evening. But there would be dried mud and dust dropping down and bark as the people would patch those flat roofs with those large slabs and all this would be trickling down on the people. And then after the intruders had everybody's attention because of that, they lowered this crippled man down to the master's attention. Now the Bible doesn't identify who they are. I think almost intentionally, part of the grand parade of, of people in Scripture who have done deeds or made contributions, can, whose identity can only be assumed or guessed. There were several people, for instance, unnamed who made appearance, like the woman who touched his garment in, in Jesus' ministry. And the inquisitiveness that they brought really gave a great opportunity for teaching of an eternal clarity. Well, look at it. These four men peering over the edge of this hole as they lay the friend down at Jesus' feet capture the essence of what I would classify as the cure for the crippled culture which you and I are part of. I mean, capture. There, there are four characteristics, I think, that are worth noting about them. Let's, let's mark these down. Number one is compassion. They were concerned enough to want to not just talk about it, but to do something, and it motivated them to action. Nothing can move a person more forcefully to responding than love and concern is exhibited toward them, and nothing can move us to respond to people's needs than compassion. Several weeks ago, in between services, I was looking out the window of a church I was preaching at. I saw a woman pull her van up let down the door of the van and got out a wheelchair that she lifted and put down and lifted a very large teenage boy out of his seat down that ramp into that wheelchair to go to church. And I thought, how many times do you think she's done that? Why does she do that? You see, because compassion drove her. My question to you is, do you care enough about your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, who could really use the touch of Jesus upon their crippled condition and change the course of their life and their family. You'd also have to note their faith. Mark specifically identifies that when Jesus said when he saw their faith, which we'll see in a few moments, the evidence that it was there and the reputation of Jesus brought them to this moment, but they had no guarantees of what could happen. I mean, they encountered a, 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 a crowded place. They didn't have a note from Jesus by saying, hey, bring him by about 11 and I'll see if I can get to him. They stepped where they could not see, risking for the sake of another, believing if we can just get him to Jesus. You've got people in your acquaintance, you've thought to yourself, if I could just get him to a small group of which I'm a part, if I can just get him to a church service, if I can just get him to be a part of this ball team. And this is important because you have no guarantees that, you know, the opportunity. This church has a drawing power and they need that. And you need to be able to do that. And such confidence in, in, in all is important. But if you believe that Jesus is the hope of the world, and I know that you do because you're here. If you believe he's the only way to God, if you believe the church is designed to multiply and change the world, Paul said faith and hope always align in the Christian life through compassion and faith in the power of Christ. Do you believe that? Third, you'd have to note their creativity and resourcefulness. There's some quick thinking as they encountered the crowd blocking the entrance. And I always admire you people who have the creative gene. 
<clears throat> that you can think outside the box, that you think outside of convention, that you refuse to be hemmed in by circumstances, <coughs> Excuse me. or that you heed inconvenience. I'm always a, a fan of the creative people who work within the church environment. A lot of them in the children's and then in the youth ministry. It's so important. The reason I think it's important is because there's a statistic, I don't know how they arrived at it, but there's a statistic that says only 7% of the people are self-starters. <clears throat> Other people need someone to be able to lead them. And so here those people are important in the church be creatively drawing. And you've done that during this season. You've done that during this time. Let's also include the tenacity and the boldness as a component. The doorway and the windows were blocked. There wasn't a way to get close enough to get Jesus' attention. <clears throat> but the inventive person may have suggested it, but it took the tenacious, hardworking effort of the grunt people to carry it out, didn't it? They refused to quit in spite of the serious obstacles. This was too important not to do, even if it required heavy lifting. My brother and I have <clears throat> frequently referred to a Sunday when we were very young, when we awoke in our Pennsylvania home to a raging blizzard and snow made the roads impossible. But my father insisted that we all pile in the car and try to go, and so all of us did, five kids and two parents, got in, went about 20 yards before we got hopelessly stuck. My brother and I eyed each other in that silent language of siblings, basically was saying, all right, we're going to be able to go in a barn and play basketball all morning rather than have to go to church. No, there was going to be a church service in our living room that day. Both of my parents were Bible school teachers, and so we got Bible school lessons from both of them. And grape Kool-Aid and Nabisco saltines served as communion. And my older sister played the piano, and she was horrible. But we had church in that farmhouse on a blizzard day in Pennsylvania because of some tenacious people. Do you think that was important? Seems so insignificant. But here I am, 60-something years later, talking about it. And I know my brother has many times as well. Just look at the sweaty faces of those guys peering over the edge of that roof. It wasn't an easy task carrying that guy up those skinny stairs. Get him up on the roof and then lower him down. You have to admire the tenacity, don't you? As I've already noticed, Jesus was impressed. And I really think he looked at them before he ever addressed and looked down to the guy. Listen to the rest of the passage. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, it was, it was the thought of that day that sickness and sin were inexorably linked. You were sick because you had sinned. I mean, once the disciples saw a man who had been born blind, and they said to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? <laughs> Putting even more guilt upon parenthood, right? Jesus said neither of them, but that the glory of God could be seen. Now listen to me. We live in a fallen world where sin and has brought disease and sickness, as well as death. But we are not punished each time for the misdeeds with a physical illness. Now sometimes we can perpetuate an illness 
by sending more alcoholism or drug addiction is an example. But sickness is a part of living. And every single one of us here gathered this morning is infected with a terminally sexually transmitted disease. It's called humanness. I checked before I left home this morning. The death rate in your community is 100%. Everybody dies. So Jesus said to the sick man, your sins are forgiven. Now immediately I touched a nerve in his critics. Again, interesting how critics can even get in a crowded room, right? They said, that doesn't sound right to me. And then they were really taken back when Jesus read their thoughts and startled them. And he said, which is easier? Which is simpler? And then he turned around and he did both of them with a walking man sealing the deal. And you can see their dilemma when that happened because by their own stated beliefs, the man could not be cured unless he was forgiven. He was cured, therefore he was forgiven, which means that Jesus could cure sin and it must be true he is who he says he is. And this had to gall them and, and I think it was the beginning of the end because of his critic's decision from that point on. But I want you to focus on something and don't forget this. The primary focus of Jesus' ministry and the secondary benefit of his presence is sometimes switched. What Jesus was doing in this moment was reassuring man of God's forgiveness and acting as God representative by saying, everybody can have their sins forgiven. The primary duty of Jesus was to bring cleansing, which sin had stained beyond repair to bring freedom which had been enslaved, to bring life to the guilty which was under the sentence of death. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to God's riches and grace. That's the primary message of Jesus coming, to save you, to get you free. Novelist Lewis Hines said that when he was a boy, he always respected and admired his father, but honestly, he was also afraid of him. One Sunday, when sitting in church next to his father, he said it was a hot day long before air conditioning or anything, and I was drowsy and getting sleepier and sleepier and began to drift off. When just I was about to go off, I could see out of the corner of my eye my father's arm go up, and I thought either he's going to strike me or he's going to shake me. And I looked up at him in fright, and I watched as he smiled at me and took his arm and put it around me and drew me to his chest and held me tightly and cuddled me in a, in a clasp of understanding and love. And Lewis Hines says, from that day I realized my father really loved me. And I suddenly realized this is exactly what Jesus was bringing to all of us primarily a loving embrace called forgiveness. Now, a secondary benefit to Jesus' presence was the healing to needed bodies. But Jesus was not called primarily to a healing ministry, and neither is this church. He was called primarily to a forgiving one because the benefits that come through the healing of the body wouldn't happen to everybody, and it didn't happen to everybody who was present. But forgiveness is available to every single one of us. Being able to walk was a great gift, but it was temporary. We all get carried out in the end, don't we? But being forgiven is forever with immediate relief and acceptance and joy. Boy, you can say this is a great story. Literally could call it breakthrough evangelism, couldn't you? Is it break through the roof? The tattered roof now speaks to us as well as the walking paralytic says so much to our crippled culture. Okay, let's get practical. What does this really apply to us? I mean, you know, we're not going to see this dramatic thing happen. Well, here is a couple things I want you to remember from this story. Number one, when we direct people to Christ, most people are going to need a lot of help. They're going to need a lot of assistance. I think because there are countless Tom Brady's in our local culture who are busy massing for themselves golden trinkets and finding no fulfillment, 
that their God-sized hole refuses to accept any of these offerings, but they're confused and they're distracted by all the humanistic and, and religious distortions. And basically they're crying out without saying it out loud, can somebody help make any sense of this and show me clearly where life and joy can intersect and make a difference? My grandson graduated from Cedarville University before he graduated, when he was senior year, he said, Grandpa, Charles Krauthammer is going to come and speak uh, one night, and I got a ticket for you. And I was really happy. I, I enjoyed Charles Krauthammer. Some of you may remember or may not. And I went up there, and never forget when he was wheeled out and brought out on the wheelchair. <coughs> and, uh, you know, he spoke, and he was brilliant. But suddenly, in the midst of that full auditorium in, in two levels, he stopped, and he said, I want to say something. I really admire you evangelicals because of the joy and the sense of discovery that you have. I'm not one of you yet, he said, but I thank you for showing that. Now, I hope before he died, he became one of us because the opportunity was there for people like Charles Krauthammer and Tom Brady. But most people are going to need a lot of assistance getting there, aren't they? And the second point of that is we're going to discover serious obstacles confronting us trying to bring them. You see, every worthwhile endeavor is going to be met with obstacles that threaten to stop it cold. And I believe that when we anticipate them, it better prepares us to go through them as we use our integrity and ingenuity to circumvent the situations and bring it together. You may have asked your friend or your loved one many times to come and join you in church or to go on, on this event. Do it again because there's going to be a lot of excuses. There's going to be a lot of obstacles that are presented there. Expect that. And thirdly, we need to focus more upon results than we do about who gets the credit. I am touched by the anonymity of these four guys because they are not identified because all they were concerned about is their friend's well-being. They didn't want to be applauded. They didn't want people patting them on the back. Everybody likes praise. Everybody likes to be noticed. But when it comes to help getting cripples cured, there needs to be something more important to us than us getting our props. Every successful endeavor learns the secret of progress, whether it's a team or a church or any event. The secret of progress occurs when the participants are no longer concerned with who gets the credit, but that only positive results are discovered. So to close this out, I want you to think of your church differently. What not to think of it as and what to think of it as. I don't want you to view Center Point Christian as a museum where old relics lie around and a lot of history. I don't want you to view it as a coliseum where there are a few participants on stage and a lot of spectators out there. I don't want you to think of it as a circus with live entertainment and it better be better than it was last week and better be better than the people down the road. I don't want you to think of it as a library where everybody has to be solemn and quiet. From this point on, will you join me and your staff and your leaders to choosing to let Center Point Christian become a hospital, a place of recovery, where they have a maternity ward, where sinners can be born again, where they have a pediatric care center, where babies can grow in Christ, where there's a trauma center, as we become prepared with God's remedy to any problem that comes through the door to bring needed help. Or a surgery center for the Almighty to work curing the cancerous criticism, removing infectious attitudes, and reviving the heartbeat of a spirit-filled life. C.S. Lewis said, think of me as a fellow patient in the same hospital who having been admitted a little earlier can give some advice so you can leave the crippling status 
within our culture? Can they find it because of your work? The story ends there for us. <clears throat> but if you'll let me, give me a little poetic license. I think the story went this way. After the guy picked up his mat, started making his way through the crowd towards the door, Jesus instructed him. The guys on the roof started running down the steps, high-fiving each other or whatever they did at that time, whooping it up and yelling and saying, and finally the guy gets out the door and he gets over to them and one of them says, didn't we tell you? Didn't we tell you he was great? Didn't we tell you he could do it? Didn't we, didn't we tell you? It wasn't everything we said. And suddenly the guy who had been holding up, Matt holds his hands up and he says, guys, guys, stop, stop for a second. And he looks at all four of them and he said, I just want to say something to you. I just... I just, I, and the words don't come out because the tears are filling his eyes. And one of them says, hey, that's okay. Just seeing you walk is more than reward for us and anything you could say. And the Bible says you got to go show yourself to the priest to prove it's true. And then we want you to go home and surprise your family and give them the joy of the seeing you walk. We got to go back up on this roof and repair this guy's roof before we leave here today. You're right. It's pure speculation. But don't you think that from those guys who did that, that's exactly what happened. Wouldn't you like to have that joy that somebody could be able to find the cure to their crippled nature, even though they don't know they're crippled, because you brought them to the feet of Jesus? That's a challenge for us, isn't it? Bow with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for forgiving us. That is so needed and so evident. It's important for us to be able to see the value of that by sharing it and letting other people who don't know who you are and what you've done so the joy can come to their life. We come to a moment of communion, an opportunity for us privately to share with you and with one another an important lesson through simple elements. May we be reminded because of the cross, the communion service repeats to us, you're forgiven, you're whole. I hold it no longer to your charge. May the joy of that as well as the humility of it come for us. In the name of the living, the reigning, and the soon returning Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.